So let me also get this calculator starting to load. So we talked about the inverse trade functions and in general, um, we use inverse trig functions to solve equations. That is, you know, being able to, to mentally evaluate the, let's say, the arc sign of the square root of two over two is not something we'll be doing super often. If we needed it, we could plug it into our calculator. But it's still useful as a reminder of what the art sign is doing. It's useful as a pedagogical tool that the arc sign of an act of a number, what is this? It's the angle between, you happen to remember the restriction we put on the sign? Is it like if zero is greater than x, then it would be greater than five? Is that what you're talking about? Um, what, what I'm talking about is that when we defined the arc sign, we took the inverse of the sign, but we couldn't take the inverse of the whole thing because it's not one to one. So we put, here I'll put it, we put this restriction on the sign. That let us take the inverse, that let us define the arc sign. So the arc sign of the square root of two over two is the angle between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, such that the sign of that angle is the square root of two over two. So the arc sign of the square root of two over two is what? This is one of the, um, the angles we learned. So, good thought, but the sign of negative one is not the square root of two over two. We're looking for a number whose sign is the square root of two over two. And I mean, there are really only a few options because there are really only a few numbers whose sign we know. Um, and those are zero, pi over six, pi over three, pi over four, pi over two. And the sign of pi divided by four is the square root of two divided by two. Now, there are other numbers whose sign is also the square root of two over two. Going 
I, I got the calculator, but what I probably really want is Desmos. Graphing calculator. Uh, get this up. Sine of x, square root of two over two. Y equals, there are an infinite number of values where the sign equals the square root of two divided by two. And that's why this part of the statement is so important. Because when we say, well, we're not looking at the entire number line. We're only looking at this part of the number line. Then all of those other solutions vanish and we're left with this one. Pi divided by four. So similarly, but let's, let's give a, something with a negative sign in it. The arc cosine of the negative square root of three divided by two. So this is the number between different restriction this time. No longer negative pi over two to positive pi over two. Now it's between zero and pi. Who is cosine? is the negative square root of three over two. And this might require some thought. Um, so we can be in either the first or the second quadrant. That's what being between zero and pi means. If the cosine is going to be negative, what quadrant do we have to be in? The second. The, the second quadrant is correct, Beck. Um, second or third, but there is no third quadrant thanks to thanks to this restriction. So we're looking for an angle here. And we want the square root of three over two. So the square root of three over two is one of those angle or one of those numbers, I should say, like the square root of two over two, that will hopefully start to be familiar if it isn't already. The cosine of pi divided by six is the positive square root of three over two. So applying what we know of reference angles, If this reference angle is pi over six, then this angle will have the correct cosine. It will be the square root of three over two because of the reference angle. It will be negative because it's in the second quadrant. 
So the arc cosine of the negative square root of three over two is what? Five, five over six. Five pi over six. Remember that there are pi radians in the straight line. So five pi over six together with the reference angle pi over six gives you the straight line. The arc tangent. Um, We're less likely, I think, or let me say it a little more positively. The arc tangent probably requires um, even more thought because we don't, we never really learned the tangents of numbers. Like we learned the sine of pi over three, pi over four, pi over six, and we learned the cosine but we never memorized the tangents. We could certainly figure the tangents out. They're the sine divided by the cosine, but it's not something we are likely to have at the tip of our tongues, as it were. But maybe we can figure this out. A number whose tangent is one. Well, the tangent is the sine divided by the cosine. So the tangent being one tells you the sine equals the cosine. And can you think for a bit, there is an angle we know whose sine and cosine are the same. Well, if you don't remember off the top of your head, it's probably not productive to be, you know, flipping through notes. Um, pi over four. The sine and the cosine are both the square root of two divided by two. They're both the same. So the tangent of pi over four equals one. Check that we're in radians. The tangent of pi over four is indeed one. So that's, we can, since we have the calculator up, we can double check our answer. The calculator uses this negative one notation as opposed to my arc notation. But the arc tangent of one is, well, I, our calculator, of course, is giving us a decimal, but that decimal is pi over four. So there's probably one thing that's that's pretty traditional um, to do. I can't pretend that I've had to do this a lot in the real world, as it were, but 
you know, if you're teaching trigonometry one day, this is going to be something you might have to teach. And it's taking a composition of trig function and inverse trig function where the functions don't match. If we had the tangent of the arc tangent of one seventh, what would that be? Just one over seven. Just one over seven. The tangent and the arc tangent cancel each other out. They're inverses. And I mean, there are, you know, there are little footnotes you put next to that statement, but the tangent of the arc tangent of one seventh would be one seventh. For the sine. It's not clear. And what I'm actually going, no, no, I'll leave this problem be. We can do a more complicated problem later on. There are sort of two ways to approach this problem. Um, the book presents them both. Both of them start by saying, Let's give this thing I might have these written. Ah, no, this is great. This is exactly what I want. Both of them start by use by giving that um, inside function a name. Let's call it theta. And then both proceed by taking the tangent in this case of both sides. I mean, I selected the tangent here because I want to get rid of the arc tangent. And that's, uh, did I, I must have erased it. Um, but the tangent and the arc tangent of one seventh cancel each other out. And they give you one seventh. And now we have options, but I think one of these options is easier, especially when you're working with numbers other than the sine and the cosine. And the number that I think is the method that I think is easier is going to be to draw a right triangle. In particular, the tangent of an angle on a right triangle is the opposite over the adjacent side. So I'm going to draw a picture where the opposite side is one and the adjacent side is seven. That theta has a tangent of one seventh. And I'm going to make a note.
that the saw you don't you wouldn't have to like do this in homework or whatever. It's just a reminder for me that the side of the arc tangent might be positive or it might be a negative. And the reason that I'm making this note to myself is that when we draw a right triangle, the sides of the right triangle have to be positive. I mean, that's just geometry. And you might have sort of figured out what we're going to do. We want the sine of the arc tangent. The arc tangent is what we've called theta. So we're going to use right triangle trigonometry to find the sine of theta. But when we use this method, we're always going to get a positive answer. So the last thing we're going to have to do is double check that. Do we want a positive answer or should we be have a negative answer instead? So with that sort of caveat out of the way, Let's find the sine of theta. So how do we find the hypotenuse, first of all? Two, seven squared plus one squared equals six squared. That's exactly correct. We are using the Pythagorean theorem here. And the square root of 50, we could simplify, it's 25, 50 is 25 times two and 25 is a perfect square, but that's not really the point of this problem. So I'll just write the square root of 50. And the opposite is one. And the hypotenuse is the square root of 50. So we have answered our question. Or have we? Of course, I already made a note that once we get this number, we then have to think about it. So let's think about it. The arc tangent of one seventh is a number between negative pi over two and positive pi over two, whose tangent is one seventh. So we're in either the first quadrant or the fourth quadrant. That's what that tells us. Which quadrant are we in? I hear the first. I agree with the first. And the way we know it's the first 
is that in the first, the sine and the cosine are both positive. So when we divide them, it's positive. In the fourth, the cosine is positive and the sine is negative. So if we divided them, we'd get a negative number. But we have a positive number. So we must be in the first quadrant. And then once we recognize that we're in the first quadrant, then now we're taking the sign of this number. Well, all is well, because the sign of an angle in the first quadrant is positive. Let's do... Me think. The tangent of the arc cosine of negative three. So if I've constructed this problem correctly in my mind, it's going to work out basically the same as the last problem did, except that we'll have to manually make it negative at the end. So, we'll call this theta. What should I do now? Just following the pattern from the previous problem. Cosine theta, you're going to make it equivalent to the cosine of the arc cosine. Yes. Negative three over seven. That's exactly correct. Thank you. And now. It's usually, I want to say it might always be true, that if there's going to be any nonsense with the sign, S-I-G-N sign, positivity or negativity, it will become obvious when you construct the right triangle. So the cosine is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse side, but we cannot write down a right triangle such that the adjacent over the hypotenuse is negative. So we have to kind of shrug our shoulders. and make everything positive with the understanding that we're going to come back to this later. And we're going to ask, is stuff, is stuff supposed to be positive or should our answer actually be negative? We want the tangent of theta. Moses, you put the three on the opposite, not the adjacent. Thank you very much.
And you don't want to be cute, I should say. You don't want to be like, okay, well, what if I make, what if I pretend that's negative three? Because, well, because it doesn't really work because it's going to change. Like, do you want to pretend that three is negative? Or do you want to pretend the seven is negative and you'll get different answers? So it really is the right thing to do to just ignore the negative side for a moment with the understanding that we'll come back to it. Then three squared plus the opposite side squared is the hypotenuse squared. So nine plus the opposite squared is 49, am I right? Yes, seven squared. Subtract that nine over. And then again, we could do something with this. Um, 40 is four times 10, 10 is a perfect square. Again, that's not really the point of the problem. We don't want to get distracted. by stuff that's not really what we're trying to learn today. And now, the reason I found that square root of 40 is that we want the tangent of this angle. Opposite over adjacent. The tangent of theta is the square root of 40 over three. Except that we promised that we'd look at the sign of this. I wish we had, I wish sign S-I-G-N and sign S-I-N-E were not pronounced the same. Um, we promised we'd look at the positivity or negativity of this thing, just like we did over here. Here, we looked at it, but we didn't have to do anything. Here, we'll have to make some adjustments, or at least if I'm thinking about this problem in the right way, we will. So theta is the arc cosine. of this negative number, negative three over seven. So theta is between zero and pi. And the cosine of theta is negative. The cosine of theta is negative 3 over 7. So our options are the first quadrant or the second quadrant. But which quadrant is theta in? Second is correct, because the second is where 
the cosine is negative. So then when we take the tangent of theta, is that positive or negative? I hear negative, a little uncertainly maybe. Remember that the tangent is the sine over the cosine. So if you're ever struggling to think, is this positive or is this negative? You think, well, the sine's positive here, but the cosine is negative and you were correct. This is negative. So our answer was not quite right. In fact, the tangent of theta is the negative square root of 40 over 3. And that brings us to the end of inverse trigonometric functions. Although I should say, you know, sometimes you get to an end of, of a section and that's kind of it. Like we haven't used the arc length form to the since we uh, learned it. Obviously, though, a lot of trigonometry is very cumulative. I mean, we've kept using the right triangle trigonometry, for example, and we will keep using the inverse trig functions. I mean, this is how we solve equations. We need them if we're going to solve actual problems. So I say this is the end of it. What I really mean is it's the end of the section. Having said that, the way, I mean, I was going to say the way the textbook is ordered is a little odd. I don't know if there's a better way of ordering it. Um, this next section, we're not going to be, this next chapter, I should say, we're not going to be doing a lot with this, but we'll come back to it the chapter after next.